great and mighty are you, Jesus, glory to the Lamb of God. Lord, we lift our hands in worship, we magnify your voice. Two months ago, I began this series teaching on uh, what Jesus meant by John chapter 19 and verse 30, where the Bible says Jesus shouted at that cross, he said, it is finished. And so we wanted to go deep into that scripture and begin to look at the panorama of scriptures and to be able to fully ascertain what he meant by it is finished. Because he didn't say all is finished. He said it is finished. And uh, any studious Bible student would want to be able to go into the word of God to know exactly what it is that Jesus was referring to. We know in our African culture, anybody saying, for example, the, the last words of a dying man are very important. So anybody is shouting something like that on his deathbed or her deathbed would inspire the people who are left standing be around the, the, the deathbed to want to go and ask, what are you referring to when you say it is finished? Could it be meaning somebody is finished? Could it be meaning the whole family is finished? What exactly do you mean? Because he didn't say, I am finished, because that was the most logical thing to say, according to the people who stood by him. I mean, he was the one who was being crucified. He was the one who was dying. But instead of Jesus saying, I am finished, he said, it is finished. As if to say he was not actually the one getting finished, but it was something that he came to do that he was bringing to a completion by his death on that cross of Calvary. And so basically that is what we want to do. And uh, we began with the first point of the 16 things that Jesus finished. And the first point was that Jesus came to fulfill every scripture that was written concerning him. And so when he hung on that cross, he actually said it's finished to refer to the fulfillment of every scripture ever written concerning Christ. His life, his birth, his suffering, his rejection, his crucifixion, and everything that was to do with a prophetic uh, dimension of Jesus because he was foretold. It was foretold what he was going to be, what he was going to become and stuff like that. Number two, we said what was finished was the total defeat of the enemy. One of the missions of Jesus on earth was that Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of Satan. The Bible says that very clearly. For this cause was the Son of God manifested that he may destroy the works of the devil. And so we learned that that when he hung on that cross, he said, devil, you're defeated. So when he was shouting, it was a declaration, not of intent, but it's a declaration of victory, a statement that is emphatic that the devil is totally finished. So as a believer in Christ Jesus, I want for you to know that the devil is nowhere near to you in terms of power. He can run interference, yes, but once you begin to know the position you have in Christ. Not so much that you really prayed and that you really fasted, that you really paid the price, but that we are standing on the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price and he put us in a place of authority and he put the enemy under our feet. We are not trying to put the enemy under our feet. The enemy was put under our feet 2,000 years ago. The Bible says he made the enemy our footstool and now we have the victory in the name of Jesus. So that was number two. Number three, we said there was the breaking down of the middle wall to make the Jews and the Gentiles one. In other words, before the death of Jesus Christ and before his work on earth, the Bible clearly says that God was called the God of the Jews. It was the God of the Hebrews. He was not the God of all the world. Yes, in essence, yes, he was the God of all the world because he created the whole world. But somehow God had singled out a tribe through which he could be able to manifest himself to the rest of the world. He singled out the Jews and he said, I'm the God of the Jews. Every time you read the Old Testament, you keep hearing him being referred to as the God of the Jews, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And you would never have become the God of James or the God of Jacob or the God of whoever is watching, Eva, Aklite, and the rest of us. I mean, he would never have been called our God if Jesus didn't hang on that cross. After he hung on that cross and he shouted, it's finished, now he can become the God of Wanyama, he can become the God of Odhiambo, he can become the God of uh, Kamau, he can be called the, co the God, he can now be called the God of Wanjiko, he can now be called the God of the Pokomos, the Boranas, the, I mean, name them, all of us have 
access unto God. Why? Because there was the breaking down of the middle wall, making the Jews and the Gentiles one. Number four, we say that when he said he's finished, he made he had made a way of personal access unto God. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 14, should be verse 7. Jesus said, I am the way, verse 6. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Number five, we said that when he hung on that cross, Jesus said, it is finished. By that he meant he came to end the reign of death. Before Jesus came, death was reigning as a monarch. It was in charge. It was killing people. All have sinned and so all and under the rulership of death that everybody is subject to death. But when Jesus came, he said, all that believe in him shall not perish. The other word is shall not die, but have everlasting life. So once you are given everlasting life or eternal life, that means that even for us who are believers, the Bible doesn't refer to us as people who die. He says, we go to sleep. That's why Jesus said, when Lazarus literally died, Jesus said, our brother Lazarus sleeps and I'm going to wake him up. So the point is that it is sleep. Anybody that sleeps will wake up. And the Bible says that those who quote unquote die in Christ will be resurrected because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So when he came to die, he came to die to defeat the power of death. He defied death by coming back to life. It was not just that he defied the death by coming back to life, but he also continually demonstrated to us that anybody dead could come back to life. You remember Jairus' daughter who came back to life. You remember Lazarus who came back to life. Jesus had the power to summon somebody from the dead back into life. And he made it even more powerful when he himself died and resurrected. The Bible says God could not allow him to rot in the grave, but he got resurrected in the name of Jesus Christ. So we basically are saying that the reign of death was ended by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. In uh, number six, we say there was the consolation of the power of sin. Consolation of the power of sin. That before Jesus died, we were really under sin. All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So if all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, you can just realize that before Christ came, literally there was no hope, but he became our hope when he came and canceled the power of sin. The Bible says if any man is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The nature of sin is taken care of and the nature of righteousness is imputed unto us. So in other words, you don't have to sin like you used to. The he gave us that power to say no to all forms of and manifestations of ungodliness. And so we say that. And then number seven, we say there was uh, the making of peace between God and man. Another word for that was reconciliation, which we took a lot of time to look at. The whole of last week, we did a Bible study on Tuesday. We did a Bible study on Thursday. And if you missed that, you can just all be able to go back into our page and you'll be able to find those videos over there and they will be a blessing to you. And now today, I want to take some time and probably if time allows, talk to you about two things and two things. And the first one I want to talk about is number eight, that when Jesus died on that cross, it was a demonstration of obedience unto death. That is point number eight, that Jesus demonstrated obedience and love to death. A demonstration of obedience and love to death. And that is important. Why? Because uh, before the death of Christ on that cross, nobody had ever demonstrated what I would call perfect obedience unto God. Every one of us had flaws. The only perfect, sinless Lamb of God was Jesus Christ. He came, he was born, he lived, he walked, he demonstrated the power of God, and he lived in what I would call perfect obedience, all right? Perfect obedience. And why is this important? It is important because Jesus demonstrated to us that he is an example we can follow. Now, let me read for you a few scriptures that will help you understand what I'm trying to say to you. Thank you all of you that are following. Thank you for every comment that you're bringing across. Let's begin with the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8 to 11. Philippians 2, 8 to 11. If you can kindly share and share on WhatsApp platforms, uh, we'll be so glad to have many more come. Invite your friends and so we can learn together. And so we say the number 8 thing that Jesus was meaning when he said, them, when he said it is finished is that he had demonstrated demonstrated obedience and love to death. 
demonstration. And that word demonstration is very important. Before even get to Philippians, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 8, that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. What is that demonstration? It is a show. It is illustrating. It is providing an example so that others may be able to follow along and others may be able to learn from you. Now, when, when Jesus demonstrated, what he meant is that this is how love is demonstrate, and, uh, demonstrated. And I want to say this to you. Love that cannot be demonstrated does not exist. Just like faith without works is dead. Faith that cannot be demonstrated does not exist. So God did not just love us in theory, but he demonstrated this love. God demonstrated this love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is an example for us to follow. That we should not just be uh, theoretical followers of Jesus, but we should be able to demonstrate it. That our love for God should be demonstrable. That our love for believers should be demonstrable. That uh, because he demonstrated his love and obedience, we also are called upon to be able to demonstrate our own love. Because he has loved us and because he has empowered us to live a life that your day for us to be able to live. We also can demonstrate the power of God. We can demonstrate love. We can demonstrate philanthropy. We can demonstrate uh, grace. We can demonstrate every good thing that is written in the word of God. We are called upon to be able to demonstrate. And that is what we call the life of obedience. The life of obedience. Jesus demonstrated obedience. And to death. Why do I say this is important? Because when Jesus hung on that cross, before he hung on that cross, on that particular night, there was an option for him to bail out of uh, the plan for our salvation. There was all opportunity for him to do that. You remember he prayed and said, Father, if you will, let this cup be taken away from me. In other words, it's a difficult one. In fact, he actually said, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. In other words, they are frailties within me. I really want to do what is right. But there is a weakness because he suffered like we suffer human beings. He was uh, subject to all the temptations we had. But as we're going to see in point number 10, he was without sin. Because if he had ever sinned and fallen short, then he would not have been the perfect lamb for our sacrifice, for the sacrifice of our sins. He had to be the perfect, blameless, spotless lamb for our sins. But he was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. Now, there's a difference between being tempted to sin and actually succumbing to the temptation and sinning. We need to be able to understand that, that there is the aspect of being tempted to something, and then there is actually succumbing to that temptation. And so Jesus was tempted, but he did not succumb. And I pray for us that even as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be tempted in all ways. But we must, by the grace of God, be able to demonstrate obedience. And whenever you fall short of the standards of obedience, you can always come back to God. Because the Bible says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with the feeling of our infirmities. The Bible says he's been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. That's why the Bible says, let us boldly come before him to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in good time for every need. He can be able to identify with us. We do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with the feeling of infirmities. In other words, God gets you. Jesus gets you. He knows where you are. He knows that corner that you think he doesn't know. He's been where you are. He was tempted to doubt God. He was tempted to tell God that your will is too difficult for me. If it is possible, take away this cup, these sufferings, these challenges, please. If you are able to take it out, please take them away. But he ended up saying, this is the turnaround. He said, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And the will of God was that Jesus goes through the cross, not evades the cross. And sometimes God will put a cross in our way. And it doesn't matter how many times we try to evade that cross. If it's a cross we are meant to be crucified on, the best way is after you prayed and there is no other way, you say, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. This is what I would have desired for it to be, but it is otherwise. It's not what I thought it should be. In fact, if I were to put it another way, what do you do when God's will involves a cross? 
when God's will involves something you didn't foresee. And, and the Bible says, when, when it comes to us believers, our call is that, uh, that uh, whoever should follow Jesus should take up his cross and follow him. You never carry a cross you're not willing to be crucified on. In other words, there is, a, there, is a, there is a way in which God is telling us, as you follow me, there are things you're going to go through, there are challenges you're going to face, but I want you to stay focused. I want you to believe in me because I will the best for your life, and in the end, it shall come to pass. Now, if Jesus was able to demonstrate obedience, motivated by his love for God, and he was willing to go to the cross with it. And when he hung on the cross, he said, I have been able to demonstrate my obedience. I have fully obeyed you, God. And this is a show that I love you. It's not that I love you with the mouth only, but I love you with my heart. That's what Philippians chapter 2, now where we are. Philippians 2, verse 8 to 11. Philippians 2, 8 to 11, the Bible says, And after Jesus had appeared in human form, he abased and humble himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even death on the cross. Wow. He carried his what? His obedience to the extreme of death. Now that for me is a true demonstration of love. That Jesus would be able to carry his obedience to the extreme of death. Now, death is actually the ultimate, if what we put it. To be able to obey God until you're dead, that is something that is not easy for each and every one of us because we value and love our lives, you know. But Jesus was willing to obey to the very extreme of death, even death on the cross. Why did he do that? Number one, to demonstrate that obedience is everything we've got to go through. And the Bible says, and look at now the result of his obedience. The Bible says, verse 9, Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that in or at the name of Jesus, every knee should or must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that is a mouthful right there. Let me go back and uh, just illustrate something here before we go on. Um, it says this, it says, uh, after he had appeared in human form, Jesus abased himself, abased himself and humbled himself still further, carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even death on the cross. So it's not just enough that he died, but that the Bible goes on to say he died on the cross. The death of the cross was one of the most cruel deaths. You know, there's this euthanasia where people can euthanize you and then you just die peacefully in your sleep and stuff like that. No shame. You died a quote-unquote respectable death. The death of Jesus was not respectable. It was cruel. He had been beaten 40 lashes minus one. I mean, he had gone through whatever. He had been spat upon. He had been rejected. He had been pulled around the streets. He had been, uh, uh, I mean, there is nothing as humiliating as what Jesus went through. And if I were to even go more gory in details, Jesus, when he hung on that cross, there was no single piece of clothing on him. He was totally undressed and naked on a hill, crucified in front of his followers by the Roman regime, backed up by the, by the, the traditional religious people who were there to witness his death. And to make matters worse, even people down at the cross, the soldiers were, were betting for his own garments. Look at that. What an embarrassing way to die. He was crucified in between two criminals, malefactors, one on the right and one on the left. They were killers. They were known to be notoriously wicked people. They were trying to overturn the Roman government. They were known to be insurrectionists. Now, Jesus hung in between the two thieves and died the death of a criminal. Now, it's one thing to die an honorable death if you've lived an honorable life. But to live an honorable life and then go and die a wicked death. If there were newspapers in Jerusalem that morning, the following morning, it was that they have crucified. Finally, the malefactor has been found. And you know how that uh, when uh, media means to report 
report religious people or church people how they report. They will report in the nastiest of ways. I mean, I just want to try to imagine the kind of a headline that was there when Jesus died. I mean, the, the one who fed 5,000 people finally dies. Hmm? Finally crucified. I mean, the man is taken care of. No more Jesus, you know? No more Jesus. I mean, an end of an era. And they thought it was done. They thought they had fixed him. They thought, and because he hung together with thieves, it was a way of ensuring that his legacy could not even be remembered. You could not be proud to associate with the events of the cross. And the person you followed actually died a criminal's death. You know, the way a, a drug cartel person would die, you know, he didn't die a good death at all. But then the Bible says, therefore, because he took so long to die a death that belongs to wicked people, to sinners, to people who are not righteous in every sense of the word, because he took so long, God has highly exalted him. And the feeling bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now look at the contrast that he died a sinner's death. In other words, he died a criminal death. That death he died was our own. That he was the perfect lamb of sacrifice who took upon our sins upon himself. And then he died the death of a sinner. So in other words, it was just right that he died that death because it was that he it was not that he was sinless. It was that he was sinless, but he bore the sins of the Entire world, including the sins of the malefactors on the right and the left. Although the one on the left, the Bible says, rejected that forgiveness and he died his, for his own sins. But the one on the right, he says, remember me when you come into the kingdom. And the truth is, he was forgiven. Even though it was posthumous, after he died, he found himself in paradise. And that is the faith we have in Jesus Christ, that he was willing to demonstrate obedience and love to death. Now, there are two things here. Obedience to God, love for us. Obedience to God and love for us. So the demonstration was twofold. To God, Jesus was demonstrating obedience. Of course, we can also learn from the obedience part. But I want for you to see the more profound part. That for us, Jesus demonstrated his love. And that is why I quoted again the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 5. In chapter 5, verse 8, rather, where the Bible says that uh, God demonstrated his love towards us. He, he, he demonstrated. And so that demonstration of obedience unto God and love for us is something that I find very, very important. So that when he says it is finished, he basically saying, I have demonstrated to you that I value you. I have demonstrated to you that you mean a lot to me. I have demonstrated to you that I care for you. I have demonstrated to you that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I have demonstrated to you that I care for you. I want for you to know this morning. Jesus demonstrated it. If you are at any point in your life thinking God has forsaken you, God has left you, God no longer cares for you, things are tough and difficult for you, and you're wondering whether God still exists or not. I want for you to know from the scriptures we've read today, Jesus demonstrated his love. If you could be able to do that, the Bible says he did not withhold his only son but gave him up for us all. He demonstrated that. How much more will he do for you so that you begin to understand that he values and cares for you? I want for you know, to know, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus cares and that God cares. Even with what we're going through, even with these pandemics, you know, even with what we are facing around us, the job cards and uh, the economic downturn and the challenges of family and the challenges of the betraying friends and stuff like that. I want for you to still know God cares, God loves, God values, God has good plans. He's never gone back. He never rescinds on his word. Whatever he speaks, he brings to pass. I just want for you to know that. And never ever turn your back on God. Not even once. He values for you. His value is for you and he cares for you. Let's read another scripture and then we see. But I want for you to see this. Even before you read that other scripture, the Bible tells us here, God has highly exalted Jesus and freely bestowed on him a name that is above every name. It doesn't matter how people can spoil your name. I want for you to know God is able to reverse the damage. God is able to give you another name, a name above names. You know, that's what he did with Jesus. And that is what he's done with us believers. That we had a 
very bad reputation of rebellion from God. We were rebels. We were bad people. But God reconciled us and God brought us back into harmony with himself. Now we are children of the Lord Most High. We've been reconciled and he has given us a name, a clean slate, a place to begin from. If any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. In other words, there is always a shift and a change. Because of what Jesus demonstrated and did for us, we now have a new identity in God. And I want for you to be happy it happened. I want for you to enjoy that Jesus has done all this for us because of his love for us. I totally appreciate you, Eva Sams. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, I saw Gaudentia over there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Keep sharing, keep sharing, and keep uh, keep keep talking. I, I really appreciate the input. Uh, thank you so much. Now, let's read another scripture here that will help us. Hebrews chapter 5, and in verse number 7 to 10. Hebrews 5, 7 to 10. The Bible says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up definite special petitions for that which he, only, he not only wanted but needed, and supplications with strong cryings and tears to him who was always able to save him out from death, and he was hard because of his reverence towards God. His godly fear is piety in that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. Verse 8, although he was a son, Although Jesus was a son, he learned active special obedience through what he suffered. Although Jesus was a son, he learned active obedience through what he suffered. Now that begins to answer the question of why should good people suffer? Why are you going through what you're going through yet you're a good person? Jesus was a son. You are a son of God. And the Bible says he was serving every legitimate right. Yet, the Bible says he learned active obedience through what he suffered. Could God be teaching us active obedience through what we are suffering? I totally believe so. So the Christian life is not without the crosses. It is not without the sacrifices. It's not without the pains. It is not without the thorny people and the thorny issues of life. I want for you to know Jesus, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. I want for you to know as a church and as a people, we also can learn obedience through what we suffer. As opposed to learning and becoming bitter and walking out from God and rejecting the faith, we must must learn from the script of the Bible that we also can learn obedience through what we are suffering, through what we are going through, through the challenges we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Verse 9, the Bible says, and his completed experience, making him perfectly equipped, he became the author and the source of eternal salvation to all those who give heed and obey him being designated and recognized and saluted by God as high priest after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. Now, I wish I had all the time to be able to go into all that Christology and stuff like that. But the thing I want for you to carry away today is that the Bible says we can learn obedience through what we suffer because that is the exact example that Jesus left for us. And uh, uh, talking of examples, I'll give you one more scripture. The Bible says in the book of First Peter chapter 2 and in verse number 21, First Peter chapter 2 and in verse number 21, for even to these you were called, it is inseparable from your vocation. For Christ also suffered for you, leaving you his personal example that you should follow his footsteps. Okay, that is now, that, that is something. For even to this you are called, to lead you a higher. This is inseparable from your vocation. This is not something you can separate from your walk with God. It's, you cannot just pick the goodies from God and say, the suffering bit me, I don't want. I'm not going to the suffer. I'm not going to suffer. Or, I'm not going to suffer. Or, no, 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 no. That's all you need to check it again. Because the Bible says, uh, for Christ also suffered for you leaving you his personal example that you should follow his footsteps. Now, what example is that? The verse we just read previously, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, He, although was a son, he learned active obedience through the things that he suffered. 
And that is the example that we've been left with. That's the example that we've been left with. That we also can joyfully go through challenges, joyfully go through sufferings, joyfully go through the experiences that pertain to the Christian faith. You know, you can go through it with a smile, knowing that the person who called you is faithful and his name is Jesus. The Bible says Christ also suffered for you. Now, please understand this. Before you throw your hands in the air and say, ah, yeah, yeah, this is too much. I want for you to know this. The Bible clearly tells us that Christ suffered for us. I want for you to know that before you even came to this world, Christ already suffered for you. He went through things on your behalf. He was rejected. He was spat upon. He was beaten 40 minus 1 for us because the Bible says by his stripes we were healed. Now, we, uh, what we are going through is nothing compared to what he went through on our behalf. Compared to the things Jesus went through on, for us, we cannot even begin to bring COVID-19 before God and say, God, if you don't remove this, then I'm leaving the faith. You have no appreciation of the things that Jesus went through for you. If you can still be able to breathe, you're walking, you're functioning, you're reasoning, you're okay. Just remember that there's one who obeyed God to the place of death and he actually died, died dead, dead until he was buried. And for three days he was in the grave. His body so corruption because of us, because he bore our sins. Something that he had the choice of not doing, but he chose, no, I'm not going to choose the root of convenience. I'm going to choose the root of expedience. This is what needs to be done, and this is how I'm going to demonstrate my love for humanity. I'm going to demonstrate it to death. The Bible says he left us an example, and the charge I leave to us today, I want you to think about what Jesus went through on your behalf, and I want you to think about what you're going through and I want you to compare and after you've compared arrive at a conclusion is it God you're going to serve or are you going to complain and walk out on God please don't first Peter chapter 2 verse 21 tells us clearly Jesus left us an example that we should follow his footsteps so the question is what would Jesus do if he found himself in the scenario of COVID-19 what would Jesus do if he found his house locked because of lack of rent what would Jesus do if he was rejected by friends what would Jesus Jesus do in the event that his marriage didn't work? Although, of course, we know Jesus didn't marry, you know. What would Jesus do if uh, he was a pastor and the church got closed by government because of COVID? What would Jesus do if he was rejected by, uh, if uh, a chief member of his church left, you know, you know, the, uh, the pillar left? What would he do? We all know that there are so many people who left him. Even Peter, the very cornerstone, turned and said, I do not know this man. When the fire was turned on and the heat was turned on, the people turned their backs on him and fled and some could not even associate with him. You know, there are things you can go through in life that cause people not to even want to look your way. You know, there are things, there are challenges you go through. There's just a straighter position you find yourself in and the people who you thought really matter to you, who thought really cared for you, no longer want to associate with you. I want to you to be full of cheer because God said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake like you, I value you, I love you, and I can identify with what you're going through. Even right now as we speak, God identifies with us. Jesus knows what we are facing. He knows all our troubles. That's why there's a hymn that sings, he says, Jesus knows all about our troubles. He will guide till the day is done. There is not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Amen. So we have an example to follow. He was suffering, but he was still prayerful. When we suffer, many times we forget our prayer life. He was suffering, but he did not abandon obedience. Most times when we suffer, we abandon our place of obedience and our post of obedience. I mean, he went through all that rejection, but he did not open his mouth. Most of us, whenever we go through a little challenge, it will, social media will know. <laughs> WhatsApp will know. Status will know. In fact, it keeps asking you what is on your mind. And of course, you will post it. You will give it like you see it. Or... Now, the problem of giving it like you see it is that you're not following the example of our master. And I know that we all are vulnerable in that particular situation. But I think the best way is to be able to ask yourself, 
What does the Bible require of me? To follow the footstep of Jesus Christ. And if they're the footstep of Jesus Christ, and if he was able to obey God to the very point of the grave, I'm not near any grave yet. I am going to glorify God. I am going to serve God. I make up my mind to deliberately do the will of God, regardless of how hard, regardless of how difficult, regardless of how complex or complicated it gets. My God knows my challenges. My God knows all my issues and nothing is impossible for the God that I serve. Praise the name of Jesus. So I want you to see this. First Peter chapter 4. Now that's our last scripture here on that particular point. First Peter chapter 4 verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, So since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, for you, arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose, patiently to suffer rather than to fail to please God. For whoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, is done with intentional sinning and has stopped pleasing himself and the world and now lives to please God. So he is no longer to spend the rest of his natural life giving, living by his human appetites and desires, but he lives for what God wills. Now, let me break it down for you. So, since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, all the sufferings that Jesus suffered in the flesh were for us. First Peter 4 verse 1. All the sufferings that Jesus, all right, Jesus suffered in the flesh were for us. For you, the Bible says, arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose. Same thought, same purpose. Same thought, same purpose. Amen. Good to see you, Zadok. Good to see you. Thank you. It's long, eh? Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Keep them coming. Thank you, Martha. Keep them coming. I like what I'm seeing. Amen. The Bible says we are to arm ourselves with the same thought. Which thought? To patiently suffer rather than to fail to please God. If the root of obedience includes some suffering, gladly choose it and ask God for grace as opposed to evading it and getting a shortcut. Because I keep saying every shortcut is actually a very long cut. And somebody once said, I think it was Pastor Lube once said, he said, he said that the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. The shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. In other words, if I live straight, I, I'll arrive faster. If I live straight, if I live a straight life, an open life, I will arrive faster than people who cut corners. So my prayer for is that we don't cut corners to avoid trouble and to avoid challenges, but cut straight, speak straight, talk straight. Let it be known that whoever comes to you to ask for counsel, for wisdom, let them know that they can expect that you'll deal with them uh, truthfully. You will not lie, you will not cut the truth, you will not sugarcoat, you will just say the truth as it is. Let it be known that you are living truly, that you are dealing truly, that you are working truly, and that there is nothing around it. Because Jesus Christ left us an example. He suffered in the flesh for us. So we are to arm ourselves with the same thought, with the same purpose, to patiently suffer rather than to fail to please God. For whosoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, is done with intentional sinning and has stopped pleasing himself and the world and now pleases God. Are you now seeing the significance of what he said when he said he's finished? That he demonstrated obedience. He demonstrated his love. He demonstrated his obedience. And he showed us how to obey. Even when it costs, because somebody once defined character, and they said character is the will to do what is right as defined by God, regardless of the consequences. Character is defined as the will to do what is right, as defined by God. Not what I think is right, but what God says is right. Character is the will, the will, the mental power, the desire, the will, the, resol the resolve to do what is right as defined by God, regardless of the consequences or of course the circumstances. In other words, there is going to be a consequence for doing what is right. There is going to be a consequence for doing what is wrong. So I would rather suffer the consequence of doing what is right so that the Bible says, uh, 
Light has come into the world, but men hated light because their deeds were evil. And nobody who does evil will delight that he did come to the light because light exposes what we did. If our things were brought to the light, how confident would we be to be able to stand? My prayer is that I know we all have fallen short, but I pray that God brings us to the place where we suffer through and we rise. When a man falls, he shall rise up again in the name of Jesus. In fact, this morning I came and I went to church and I've been in church praying before I came to do this broadcast and a thought struck me when I was doing that and I just wanted to share this with you and it just fits where we are right now before we come to a close and the thought was uh, I just felt like the Lord was telling me <laughs> when, when, when Samson's hair was cut it grew up it grew up again so it really doesn't matter how your hair has been cut or the experiences you've gone through that have been a letdown to your character, a letdown to God, a letdown to your family, a letdown to society around you, a letdown to you. I want for you to know that there is an opportunity for you to come back. That shaven hair grows back. Amen. That it grows back. In other words, God in grace will give you another opportunity. He will give you another shot. He will give you another shot. I mean, time and chance happens to them all. So it doesn't matter how many times you've got it wrong. There is an opportunity for you to get it right. Amen. If Samson's hair could grow again, it was a redemptive uh, gesture from God that our hair can grow again. That there is still an opportunity for us to do what is right. That we can right our wrongs and that we can change for the better by the grace of God. Not because we are trying to seek to please God, but because there is a power on the inside of us to just live the life that God ordained for us to be able to live. And so I totally believe if Jesus went through that and he died for us and he demonstrated his obedience, I pray that if you're going to be marked, I would rather you score 90 or 80% as opposed to scoring 20. And many times when you score 20, we are like, we've given up. You're like, I'm already a bad person. It's already known. Why should I even struggle? Ah, it's a, a known fact. I'm not a very good person. And so you give up on that which is right, on that which is good, because things have not added up. I pray for you today that you don't lose sight. You may have messed before and there is evidence to that. You may have gone off track before and there is evidence to that. But I don't want you to be so unkind on yourself, to keep pushing yourself down, to keep rejecting yourself, to keep beating yourself, to keep telling. Be kind on you because there is no one else who will be kind on you. Amen. Just be kind on you and just follow the grand plan of God and say, God, I fail, but I'll rise up again. If a man falls, he shall rise again. Hair will grow again. Hope will come back again. It doesn't matter. You're right. It doesn't matter how many times you've fallen before. A righteous man may fall seven times, but he will rise up again. Seven is the number of perfection. In other words, you've fallen perfectly, but you can rise up again. And if you resolve today, Today can be the first day of the rest of your life of obedience. It can be the first day. Today can be a turning point for you. Now that you know that we can demonstrate the love of God. You know Peter failed, by the way. Even Peter, when Jesus was going to die the following day, Jesus, Peter rejected Jesus. But the same Peter ended up writing the first, second, and third Peter. And in other words, there was an opportunity, a redemptive opportunity for him to pick up the broken pieces and make again into something. God wants to pick your broken pieces. He wants to make you whole again. So this is not a message to condemn. This is a message to bring you back. It's a call back to the center of God's will. And I totally believe it is within us to do what is right. It is within us to make it in the name of Jesus. I really wanted to go on to number nine, perfection of Christ. But maybe we'll do that on Tuesday. But keep following this channel because I'm sure you're going to learn a lot more. I hope you've learned something today that will take you forward in the name of Jesus. So if I just do a recap, I would want to say this. Jesus, today we learned about demonstration of obedience and love to the point of death. And we say that Jesus demonstrated that. And we are saying that we, he left us an example that we should follow his footsteps. According to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, that we should follow his footsteps. Now, I pray that you are able to, uh, to be able to see. The only way you'll know his footsteps is when you read the word. Stay in the word. Read the word. As you read the word and stay in the word, you'll know the footsteps to take. The Bible says his word is lamp to our feet. He is the light of 
of our path. He will be able to illuminate your steps and ensure that every step you make, you're making it in the light. That you're not tripping, that you're not falling short of the grace of God, that God will finish what he began in your life. I pray that the Lord will light your path and the Lord will make you strong for his own glory. And uh, as we pray, I just pray that this word will find room in your heart and that the Lord will continually bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We bless your name today. We honor you because you're a good God, because you're a faithful God, and because you're a gracious God. Thank you for what we've learned today. You've taught us how to obey. You taught us that we are supposed to be able to demonstrate our love by a lifestyle of obedience. We pray that you give us that grace. We pray in the name of Jesus that grace will be activated on the inside of us to lead us in the paths of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, we refuse to live lives of defeat, lives that are perennially sold out to sin and to wickedness, lives that are defeated, lives of of, of begging lives, of uh, poverty and of sicknesses and of diseases. No, that is not our portion. We receive the grace of God to live the life God you ordained for us to be able to live. I pray for my viewers today and those that have joined us in this online service today. Bless them, oh God, and minister to each and every one of them for the glory and honor of your name. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for what you ordained you will surely bring to pass in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Bless our giving today. Bless our sacrificing today, even if it's a tithe. Whatever your people are giving to support the work of the ministry and our continuity in the faith, we pray that you continually bless us and open our doors and so that we may experience the favor and the goodness of God. And there's always a chance to rise again. Even though we may fail several times, we will rise again and will become the people you ordained for us to be able to become. And so we thank you and we bless you. And we are blessed in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you friends for joining us today. I've been your host and pastor James Timbiti of Precious Faith Church Eldred. Great and mighty are you Jesus glory to the Lamb of God Lord we our hands in worship we mark name